Thanks to the Second World War, an inhuman effort was made to devise more efficient ways of killing large numbers of people. And part of it demanded designing very fancy weapons which could not be designed with computa without computation. So out of this came the first computers and they were amazing. They were a you know, real quantum step compared to what we had before the Second World War. And uh, already by 46, already by the peace times and so, the physicists found ways of using the computers to test some deep ideas in physics. The first application was called Fermi Pasta Ula model. So Ulam is a father of hydrogen bomb, a mathematician, and Fermi is one of our greatest physicists of the last century. And they tested fundamental idea of statistical mechanics, which is the equipartition of degrees of freedom for uh, statistical systems. And the first thing uh, that came out was totally amazing, it turned out it's totally wrong. Equipartition doesn't work. So very first attempt to use computers of that kind. By 60s, if you were in a good institution like MIT, it was already possible to get research computers. So uh, one problem up today and forever was to understand weather. So a student of Birkhoff, you know, the greatest American mathematician, at least in the field of ergodic theory of the last century, a student of Birkhoff took a job in the Department of Meteorology or whatever it's called at MIT, and it was among the first people to get access to digital computers. Or maybe it was even analog, I don't remember what the computer was. So his name was Edward Lorenz. He's actually a very good mathematician, but as far as anybody knows in popular culture, this is a, a weather person. He did something which we'll do in this course very much. He started with a very complicated system, which is a fluid dynamic system of flat earth being heated from above with a layer of fluid, which is, er, which is air. And in 19th century, the equations were written, early 20th century, called Boussinesque equations and similar equations, which explain what happens when you drive air by heating a flat surface. And what happens is convective rolls set in, and then if you heat it too hard, uh, things got turbulent. So he tried to put this on computer, and the way you put this on computer is explained in a section in a book called Life in Extreme Dimensions is for this problem it's natural to go from partial differential equation that describes the fluid to a set of couple ordinary differential equations. This happened by going from spatial representation of the fluid to its Fourier transform, which is nothing fancy, just a linear organization of degrees of freedom. But it's very elegant because it has to do with translation degrees of freedom. So one gets a large set of coupled equations. Today we solve them very well, and we find out that interesting problems that we require between 100,000 and million degrees of freedom, but the computation, the algorithms, and also the computers themselves improved so much we can do this. But in 63, this was not an option. So what Lorenz did is he wrote these equations and then he kept eliminating degrees of freedom so he could stick it on computer. Eventually he had 11 degrees of freedom, he stuck it on a computer and he looked at numbers that came out. He discovered that out of them, eight didn't seem to do much. So he eliminated those and he ended up looking at three partial coupled equations. They're very easy to write. There is a state space and now the state space is in three dimensions because only three degrees of freedom are kept. And we have our equations of motion, which are some truncation of Navier-Stokes equations, that tell us that if the fluid is some state, this is how it evolves infinitesimal in time. And in more detail, he wrote x, y, z, so three degrees of freedom, which is three Fourier coefficients, but by this time we have forgotten all about where the model came in, because this is such a dramatic truncation that it has no predictive power as fluid dynamics. 
but turns out to be extremely important as educational tool what nonlinear system can do. And that's why we appreciate his work. He was not the first, but his work was influential in a well-deserved way. So the big deal about these equations and the, why you don't get them taught in your differential equation course as an undergraduate because they have two terms here which are second order in the variables. So this is an example of nonlinear set of ordinary differential equations. And they're quadratic because original Navier-Stokes had a term which was called convective U gradient of U. So by the time you do this in Fourier modes, you end up with something that couples Fourier modes. So if they were not here, then anything one learns in engineering differential equation courses will work you with the sum of last transform and just solve this equation. However, this being the real world, none of this stuff works. You have to look at them. And what he did is he put them on computer as the first person to do so. Again, not really. Dame Lady Cartwright and mathematician Littlewood did the, that first in the war effort in Great Britain in the Second World War where they were studying duffing equation or you know, designing radars. So they discovered the essential thing. But <clears throat> and what he discovered was he put it on a computer and what is, he started is some initial condition and the thing did something. And, you know, the, what was all the revolution is just the fact that he looked at the trajectory visually. This was very hard to do. So in 1906 or something, there was a Norwegian physicist who was also an atmospheric physicist. He was interested in aurora borealis. So he was developing a motion of charged electrons in magnetic fields. And he had a bunch of graduate students, which are called amensuensis, people who did things with hands. They numerically integrated very simple equations. And you know, it took several years to produce a trajectory that on this plot would look like this, this much. And that was years of work in that time. So it's very hard to understand qualitative nature of the solutions at the beginning of century when Poincaré and other people did influential work. By 1963 he could run it and he discovered that it did something and then it did something else. And then it seemed to do something that looked like something that happened before and kept doing such a thing. You've probably seen this picture, it's called Lorentz Attractor. Now what puzzled Lorentz, you know, he was intellectually primed to understand this problem and not disregard it. Simulations were still rather painful because he had to look at numbers and plot them on a paper. But uh, what puzzled him is that he would restart the computer and he would get different solutions. And then you would think that just problem of numerics. You know, there's some problem of round off errors and something. But he was so smart to realize that this is a fundamental thing. So that's why we like it. And courses, this course, is a follow-up on his in insights and work of his teacher's insights. And what I want to emphasize today is not that it looks complicated, but if you run it for a while, you realize that this thing has two ears. It looks like a butterfly to him, but you know, it looks like somebody has two big ears. So why is that? You know? And if you run it longer and longer time, it looks more and more similar to each other. So what's going on? Now in this course we tell you whenever you have a problem and you're given a set of equations, you're first supposed to find equilibria of the problem. That's the first step. Find the solutions in which the left hand side vanishes. So zero equals this gives you equilibria. In three dimensions that's a problem you can solve numerically. I mean, you can solve actual analytic, it's simple enough. 
This is by linear, you end up in some fancy way with some quadratic equation. And you find that there are two solutions. There are actually three solutions. You know, there's kind of a trivial solution that says if everybody is zero, that's an equilibrium. So there is equilibrium here. You divide your equations by that solution, and then you find there's a quadratic equation you're solving. And the next two equilibria, let's call them one and two, the analytic form is plus minus square root of b rho minus one. Now this is a parameter that vaguely has something to do with Reynolds number and heating original physics, but it's so far away from the original physics that you shouldn't take them too seriously. So there are just three parameters in these equations. And where the equilibrium is depends whether rho is larger than one and stuff like that. But the main thing you notice is that they sit on x equal y diagonal. So now you can plot them and you discover the reason why you see two years is that eq1 and eq2 are the same solution just with a plus or minus sign. So now what you are discovering, you're discovering there is a symmetry in equations. You know, somebody handed you some equations that look like God knows what. And this is the simplest possible set equation ever. Usually you get a page of equations and you will have no idea. On the fifth floor, for example, it took us several months to discover that Navier-Stokes equations that we're looking at have a symmetry. Even though, and we did it the same way with the numerical simulation and we found out that long time solutions look symmetric, but we didn't understand why. So this is a very typical solution situation. When you have some law of nature, it might have some symmetry you're not aware of. But having it, it's, you know, it's a big deal. It's very helpful. And this is the simplest example.